Good morning everyone, a very warm welcome indeed to um, Curious About Our Planet here at Glasgow Science Centre and a, a welcome to our Learning Lab schools that are joining us today as well. Now we are absolutely thrilled to be joined by Sheila George this morning and she is from WWF Scotland and today she will be telling us all about the impact of climate change on Scotland, on our lands and our nature. So without further ado, let's get started. Hi everyone, I'm Sheila George and I'm the Food and Environment Policy Manager at WWF Scotland and I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about the impacts of climate change on Scotland's land and nature. Over the last few years, and climate change isn't new, but over the last few years, the public awareness of the impacts of climate change across the globe have really come to the fore. And children have been a massive part of that story with the school climate strikes. So as that public awareness has, has been raised, political awareness, awareness has also been raised and politicians have got behind the need to act um, and put in place the measures that we need to respond to climate change and reduce human's contribution to climate change as well. And it can often seem like an abstract concept. Climate change is something that's happening everywhere else. Um, but there are re very real examples of the impact that a changing climate are already having here in Scotland. I'm just going to go through a few of those with you. So we've already experienced a temperature rise of one degree, and we're on track for a 1.5 degree increase, potentially as early as 2030. If we were to see a two degree increase in temperatures, this could lead to about 18% of insects, 16% of plants and 8% of invertebrates losing over half of their current um, range. And in Scotland, climate change is already impacting threatened wildlife. So in Scotland, one in nine species are at risk of extinction um, from, from these islands. And that's a hugely worrying stat. And what that means is these species are already under pressure. They're under pressure from loss of habitat and change of food sources, um, over exploitation and climate change is just an additional pressure that's on top of that. So this beautiful picture of a capricale standing proud and um, capricale are already being impacted by extreme weather that impacts the survival of their chicks. Too much rain um, too much cold weather whenever they're hatching their chicks can have a massive impact. Um, and the little guy in the in the bottom right corner is a golden plover. Um, they live on Merlins and again they're already being impacted by climate change because they have evolved to hatch their young at the same time that the prey species hatch and what we're seeing is that their prey species are able to adapt much quicker to climate change so they're hatching earlier and the, the eggs of the golden plover are hatching as they always do at the same time and when they hatch there's no food available for them so climate change is already having an impact on these species. We've again already seen um, temperature rises, but these temperature rises are predicted to continue. Um, many marine species are expected to shift their range because, as you can imagine, Scottish marine species are adapted to cold, cold water um, and cold climates, and a number of them can shift further north in search of colder water. But some species are already at the northern range, northern edge of their range. Um, for example, the white-beaked dolphin. Um, they don't really have anywhere to go because they're dependent on both cooler water and shallower water. Um, so they can't find that further north and, and they are really at risk of extinction of the, of the changing climate. And lots of habitats are also at risk. Um, so the, the photograph at the background is peatland. Peatlands are really special habitats. Um, they're formed in waterlogged conditions. They need lots of rain. Um, temperate weather, so not too hot. Um, and they are also really special habitats. They're internationally important for their plant life and the birds um, and the insects that they are home to. Um, but the way that we manage peatlands impacts their ability to respond to climate change. So about 80% of peatlands um, in Scotland or in the UK as a whole actually are damaged in some way already. They've been drained or burnt or they've had trees planted on them. And what that means is they're much drier than they should be. And as the climate changes, 
um, we see fluctuations in rainfall, the peat starts to dry out. Um, and that means that we see changes in the vegetation structure that they can support. And, and that in turn changes the insects and birds and all the other wildlife that they're able to support as well. Um, and it also means that they aren't able to behave and perform in the way that they could if they were healthy to provide benefits for people. Um, and the other picture there is a salt marsh. And similarly, um, salt marshes, salt marsh is a coastal habitat. Uh, again, it stores lots of carbon. It's really important for biodiversity, but salt marsh is being squeezed up against both um, land use change. So it's being squeezed against towns, being squeezed against hard sea defenses as temperatures rise and sea levels rise. And they're being, they're being lost at a massive rate. Um, so again, that impacts the species that live there, but it also impact, impacts the wider benefits that they provide to society because these coastal habitats are our first natural defense to climate change and they protect us from flooding. Farmers are also being impacted. So um, this slide shows a study that we did in 2018. Um, the beast from the east obviously was the, the big uh, low light, uh, weather low light of 2018, but there was a whole combination of extreme weather that happened one thing after another that year that really had a massive com combined impact. So we had wet, a wet, very wet winter straight into beast from the east with months of snow, then we went into months of drought conditions and um, loss of water availability. And we calculated that the impact of that on Scottish farmers was about 161 million pounds just from that one year. And that included loss of stock, um, loss of crops, both because they couldn't get them into the ground and then they couldn't get them out of the ground. Um, it was increase in feed required because there wasn't any grass available. Um, and it had huge wide ranging impact then also on the farm gate price of some foods. So it's here, it's happening already. And in urban areas, we also know that large parts of Scotland are going to be at risk of, of flooding. And um, this is very much linked to how we manage the land and how we manage those habitats elsewhere as well, because the way that we look after our peatlands and our coastal habitats and our farmland can have an impact on how water moves through rivers. Um, and how it moves downstream and how it um, floods our urban areas. So if peat, peatlands are protected and restored and healthy, they can store an awful lot more water. And when we do get heavy rainfall, it slows the flow. If rivers are wiggly and meandering, um, the, the water doesn't flow so quickly. Um, if grasslands and floodplains are well looked after, they hold the water in times of, of uh, heavy rainfall. And it also means that um, in times of drought, the land is much better able to store water for the plants and animals that need it as well. So, you know, uh, we often see rural and urban as very disconnected, but they're very, very much connected. And what happens in the wider landscape does impact urban areas. Urban areas will continue to be impacted, particularly as we need to build more houses. Um, and that means we build more houses in areas that are at higher flood risk. And I will say some positive things in a minute, I promise. but. Um, we know that the difference between a 1.5 degree increase in temperatures and a 2% increase in temperatures could actually be catastrophic. It sounds like very little, um, but we're talking about changes from 100% uh, increase in flood risk to 170% increase in flood risk. Um, we're talking about much more severe drought, um, loss of crops, heat, heat uh, stress in crops, heat stress in animals as well. So in the short term, we might see some benefits to drier, warmer weather, but they'll be counteracted in the longer term by more rain and more unpredictable, more extreme weather. So we need to meet net zero emissions in Scotland by 2045 to be able to have the best chance of limiting temperature rises to 1.5 degrees. Um, net zero is... Uh, for an abstract again uh, term, but what essentially it means is if you look at the all of the um, boxes in blue, they're all sources of greenhouse gas emissions that contribute to climate change. And um, so agriculture is one source of transport, energy, residential, all of these things release greenhouse gases into the atmosphere that contribute to warming. The green box underneath the dotted line is the way that we can store carbon from the atmosphere and lock it up 
and counterbalance some of those emissions. And in order to get to net zero emissions by 2045, we need to make all of those blue boxes much smaller and we need to make the green box much bigger so that it balances out and, and reaches a net zero. Nature can help us do that. And in fact, nature is an intrinsic part of every pathway to net zero. Um, and Scotland has a natural advantage here. Um, we need to both reduce those emissions um, and emissions reduction from industry from that blue box is going to be much more about things like improvements in efficiency, reducing waste, investing in technologies and um, innovating. Um, whereas store, capturing and storing more carbon for the for the box underneath the line, the blue box means that we need to both we need to store more carbon in our soils and in plants. And that means we need to look after nature better. It means that we need to make sure that we're not draining our peatlands, that we're, we're blocking up those drains, that we're not burning them, and that we're not planting trees on them, that we are looking after our salt marshes, and that we are investing in nature, and that we're getting the balance right between uh, the application of pesticides and fertilizers um, and the number of livestock that we have on the hills. So that our habitats are really healthy and functioning and that they're able to deliver for us as well and we need much more integrated approaches to land use as well so trees for example have a huge capacity to store carbon um, and, and they can also deliver much wider benefits than that if we plant trees along water courses they can provide shade and um, so freshwater habitats um, are also very susceptible to increasing water temperatures. I mentioned marine species before, but freshwater species are also very susceptible and trees can actually help protect by providing shading on the water um, and, and reduce those fluctuations in water temperatures. But trees in farms can also provide areas for livestock and wildlife to hide in extreme weather, whether that's extreme wind and rain or even um, sun and warm conditions as well. So, Nature has an awful lot to offer us and we need to look after it much better. I mentioned salt marshes before as well and, and actually economically speaking, um, aside from the wider benefits that they can deliver for us, looking after salt marsh is a much more cost effective way to do flood defence where they exist than um, building a big wall that needs to be maintained um, long term and may only last 10 years before it falls apart. So investing in nature is, is a huge benefit. Um, grasslands, if we reduce grazing pressure um, and we look after our soils, we can actually improve, improve productivity um, so we can produce more food um, with less impact. So there are huge wins in looking after nature and if we look after it, it can help us respond to climate change. And in turn, that can reduce climate change's impact on these important areas. So we worked with RSPB and um, Scottish Wildlife Trust earlier last year to come up with 11 actions that we felt were essential for nature's recovery. Um, it, I mean, this was about biodiversity restoration effectively, but almost all of these actions are really important for also responding to climate change. Um, it talks about expanding Scotland's native woodlands, ensuring a sustainable and low impact fishing, um, licensing driven grouse moors is about how we manage large areas of our land. Um, managing deer populations effectively, so reducing grazing uh, pressure on some of these really sensitive habitats like woodlands and like peatlands. Um, making new developments net positive for nature and, and that's about how we plan in our urban areas. So where do we build houses? How do we do that in a way that delivers for nature and climate? How do we plan for um, sustainable um, flood management um, and drainage schemes? How do we create space for nature in our urban areas? Um, and how do we link these wild places better so that animals, when they're exposed to climate change, um, they have somewhere to move um, because there are corridors and stepping stones and networks so that if they can increase their range, their space to do so. We need to end burning on peatlands, um, and we also use compost in our gardens and um, that just really isn't compatible with our climate change ambitions anymore. We need to stop digging up peat, we need to stop using it in our gardens. We need better um, application of nitrogen. So nitrogen fertilizers are a big source of greenhouse gases. Um, invasive species are much more likely to spread as the climate changes, um, as 
climate gets warmer and less suitable for our Scottish species, more, more invasive species will come. Um, and support, supporting climate and nature friendly farming is going to be essential. Farming is a huge land use right across Scotland. Um, and, land, and farmers have a, a big role to play in managing our habitats so that they can help us respond best to climate change. And we need to protect Scotland's seas and all of the wildlife within it um, so that, it, again, it is able to adapt to these challenges. We need to remember that climate has no borders. Um, and even if we do all of these things, we still need global action on climate change. But Scotland can be a world leader. It is going to be on the stage this year. Um, and it can lead the way and it can set a really good example and we have so many opportunities um, to do so. Thank you. Welcome back. I really hope that you enjoyed that amazing presentation just as I did. It's so important um, not only for us to think about the effects of climate change really far away in other parts of the world, but to know and understand what's happening right here in Scotland. So we are thrilled to be joined live um, once again by Sheila this morning. Good morning, Sheila. Good morning. Great to be here. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, now, we have had some amazing questions come in. There's lots of interest this morning, which is fantastic. Um, and some of our uh, Learning Lab schools have sent in questions for you to answer. So we're going to get to those in just a second. But for those of you at, uh, maybe at home or at school that want to join with, in with our questions today, uh, my name is Aileen. I do hope you will send me in some questions to pose to Sheila. And the way to do that is in the uh, chat box at the bottom of the YouTube um, video today so please feel free to join in and I think we will get started with our first question if that's okay with you. So our first question today is coming in from St Bridget's Primary School so good morning to all of you and uh, this is from Primary 70 they ask what is the most surprising animal that's becoming extinct? Um, so I think there are lots of animals that we don't think of as at, at risk or at danger of becoming extinct in the UK, for example, the hedgehog. Um, lots of your parents will have be used to seeing hedgehogs in the countryside and they're actually very vulnerable now. Um, they're at risk of being hit by cars and being eaten by things. So maybe that's quite surprising for people to hear. Surprise. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, excellent, thank you very much for that. Um, our next question is from Tinto Primary, so good morning to all of you. And they ask, uh, what is the most vital change to make Earth a better place? That's a lovely question. I think question. it is a lovely question. I think there are lots of things that we need to do um, to make the Earth a better place. It's our home and it's home to lots of animals and we need to look after our home. Um, we need to look after our rainforests, so we need to stop chopping them down and we need to stop destroying habitats to build big houses and roads. We need to make sure that when we are building places for us to live, that those places are also um, friendly to, for animals to live. And we need to you know, make space in our gardens and make space in our parks so that we can live alongside nature and um, more widely looking at how we use the resources that the earth provides us, whether that's for food or for fibre, clothing and um, for fuel. So we need to just live within the means of the earth and not take more than we need. I think that's so important, isn't it, to remember that we share our planet. It's not just ours. We share it with every living we creature everywhere and we need to share everything uh, that we have with them as well and always remember that they're as important as we are. Uh, fantastic. Our next question is coming in from Riverside Primary School. And they ask, what animals do you think will be extinct soon? That's a, that's a dire one, isn't it? <laughs> Unfortunately, there's a long list of animals that um, could be extinct soon. Um, some very iconic ones like the um, Sumatran tiger, um, various species of rhino are at risk of extinction and um, the orangutan and gorillas. There's a very long list and we need to look after them and make sure that doesn't happen. Absolutely. Um, we have a question from YouTube, so this is a live one coming in, so thank you very much. Um, would reintroducing links help with managing deer populations effectively? Great question, thank you very much. One day it potentially could. Um, I think the issue is that we have so many deer right now that lynx wouldn't be able to bring the deer populations down to a sustainable level. But if we helped 
manage the deer populations to get them down to a sustainable level, then lynx could maintain that. So um, lynx couldn't eat all of the deer that we have right now to get them down to sustainable levels, but they could maintain it. Um, excellent. We have another question coming in from Philip Parmer um, on YouTube this morning. Um, what can we do to help? Oh, that's from uh, Tintel Primary School, actually. So what can we do, folks, just normal folks like myself, like all the folks watching today, what can we do to help? Um, you can do lots of things. If you have a little bit of green space in a garden, if you can create a hedgehog house or even a container pond, anything you can do in your garden. So um, May is um, no cut May, so don't cut your grass and let the let the dandelions and the daisies grow, for example, and that brings lots of bees and other insects. And if you don't have a garden, start to lobby your school to create a little bit of garden space in your playground where you can grow some plants and maybe grow some food. So I think there are lots of things that we can do to just make space for nature in our, in our homes. Excellent idea, and it's less gardening for people to do less work. Let your grass grow, let your hedge grow, let it go. Okay, next question. Uh, we are back to St. Bridget's for the next one. So let's see. And um, from Primary 70, they want to know what is something that you have done in your job that you never thought you would do? That's an excellent question. I have done many things that I never thought I would do. Um, well, during my PhD studies, I had to catch badgers and uh, <laughs> and test them for TB. So that was something that was very interesting, chasing them around the countryside, um, making sure I didn't get bitten and uh, feeding them peanuts so, they, so that they uh, went into my traps. That is an interesting one. Um, we're back to Carntine uh, Primary School next. So they would like to know, um, how do you stay positive in your role when climate change is affecting so much wildlife? This is a very good question and sometimes it's quite difficult to stay positive um, but there is so much that we can do and I think that it's really important that we all do and what helps me stay positive is knowing that I'm doing a job that is important and that we all have a role to play. It can be tricky sometimes because when we hear about climate change a lot of it is doom and gloom but it's so important to celebrate the wins uh, and the positives that we're, we're making as well isn't it? Um, next up, we have Garnet Bank Primary School, and they would like to know um, how biodiverse is Glasgow? That's an excellent question. I think we've frozen. <laughs> I think Sheila is frozen just for a wee second. Hopefully we can rectify that quickly. Um, that is a great question. Um, I think we are super lucky in Glasgow with the amount of large parks and green spaces that we have. Um, especially when Sheila was just talking there about what you can do maybe in your garden um, to sort of create green spaces to let your grass grow, to maybe grow plants that are going to be good for uh, bees and areas for hedgehogs, just welcoming wildlife to your garden. But also lots of people don't have access to those spaces, but there are so many um, really giant and open parks all over Glasgow um, where we can do these sorts of things, where we can make sure that we are looking after these green spaces. Um, we are picking up litter, we're not dropping it in the first place, you know, things like that. Um, we have seen um, coming back out of lockdown and people going back out, it's not been that great. We've seen sort of some images of our beautiful parks being covered in litter and that's just not acceptable. That's not something that we want to be doing, um, especially with what we know about climate change. And we know that that sort of stuff can really badly affect our wildlife. Um, so not only just looking after our own gardens and green spaces, but also doing our best to make sure that what we have available to us, all our beautiful parks, uh, and sort of farmlands and things like that are kept in the best condition possible and that are welcoming to absolutely everybody. Now, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully we'll have Sheila back um, just in a few seconds with us. Um, you can bring up maybe the next question. We'll see how we do with that. I'll give it a bash. I'll do my best. 
So next question, where would be the best place slash habitat to drop tree seed? And, oh, I like these. Now, I've got um, something that I'm going to be planting in my garden called bee bombs. I don't know if you've heard or seen these um, on TV or maybe online. Um, they've been advertised quite a lot as ways of attracting bees. Um, I think that what is best is a really sometimes if the ground is really dry then things don't really take um so if there's an area where the soil is still hopefully quite loose um and the seeds are able to sort of penetrate a little bit or even if you can sort of dig over turn over the soil and uh sort of sprinkle these seeds that's a, a good place to be you don't want anything to be too compact or too close together um there's a lot of things uh, there's a lot of advice that you can get online for that there's a lot of what's called rewilding if you have heard a little bit about that lately so areas of scotland and lots of other countries as well we want to rewild them we want to replant them and we want to restore um, the greenery we want to restore the trees all the things that can benefit us all the things that are going to suck in that carbon and hold it essentially and be breathing out oxygen for us plants trees um, salt marshes things like that that were being talked about earlier on are amazing and um, for helping us rectify some of the problems that we are currently experiencing with climate change so excellent question thank you very much um shall we try our next one Riverside Primary is asking what other alternative energy sources are coming that we don't know about yet? Well, let me tell you something. Okay, I saw this just yesterday. It's really exciting. So sometimes we are looking for brand new um, sources of energy that we've never seen. But also what you need to remember is that scientists and engineers are working on perfecting ones that already exist and making them better. So something that I saw just this week, which is quite exciting, is a new type of wind turbine, but it is bladeless. So it has no blades. It's just the sort of middle part of it, um, but it is a lot smaller. It's a lot slimmer. So for people that don't really like the look, for some people, they don't like the look of um, wind turbines. They think it sort of is a bit of a blight on our countryside, but they are so important. I think they look amazing. If you've never seen them up close, pop along to Whiteley Wind Farm and you'll be able to see them. But this new one has no blades on it. And what it does is basically it uh, oscillates, which means it shimmies, there's a good word, so it goes like this, right, in the wind, and it captures um, the energy from the wind and converts that into electricity. So the way the wind turbines do with the blades, this does it by shaking back and forward, essentially. And one of the benefits of this is it is safer and better for wildlife, because it can affect wildlife. Birds and um, sort of other animals can sometimes get caught up in those blades, which is very sad. But that is is an exciting one and that's something that's built and actually happening so we'll look into that now i think we might have sheila back with us i do hope so <laughs> i'm so well, sorry well, <laughs> i changed locations happens. i don't know what happens <laughs> welcome back we have been we've been answering a few questions uh, not as expertly as you but in your absence so let's get another question um in for sheila let's see what we've got so tinto primary school back to them when did you join the WWF and why? I joined almost three years ago and um, I've always worked in nature conservation. So my whole career I've worked for um, either in research or other NGOs and WWF is just such a great conservation organisation. It has worldwide reach, um, really great reputation, amazing people and yeah, lots of reasons to work there. Fantastic. Our next question, let's see. It's going to come from YouTube, so a live one just now. Let's see what we've got. So Garnet Bank Primary again, which of Scotland's native species is currently least populous? Do we know and why? That was a good one. That was big words there for me to say. Mm -mm. Mm, that is a good question, yes. <laughs> so one of the, probably one of the best, most iconic ones um, that we don't have many of left is the wild cat. And um, we have very few of those because of, well, they've been hunted. Um, they they eat things that they that farmers maybe don't like them to, etc. But they've also lost a lot of habitat, so they're very secretive and they need lots of cover. And um, as their habitat has decreased, their numbers have decreased as well. 
Excellent. So we will go uh, back to St. Bridget's again for our next question. So St. Bridget's Primary 7B, they would like to know, what is the most necessary item you need in your job? Well, unfortunately, it's a computer <laughs> because I I have work in environmental policy, so I spend a lot of time in the office, so I couldn't work without a computer. And I should say the internet, which we've just proven a minute ago. <laughs> Incremental, but very important, absolutely. Um, we have Miss Walls, Primary 6 from Altmore Park next. Uh, they would like to know, um, would... Let's see, they would like to know how many years, sorry, um, have you been doing your job? I have been doing nature conservation for over 10 years and this job for three years. Excellent. Thank you very much for that question. Um, we'll go to YouTube again for our next one. Um, what could we do in our school to help climate change and prepare for COP26? Very good, St. Bridget's, bringing up something very, very important that's going to happen, hopefully, later this year. There are lots of things that you can do um, as a school to help with climate change. Things like eating all of your lunch and reducing food waste, for example, um, <laughs> using less... <laughs> yes, <laughs> always eat all your lunch. Um, use less paper. Um, you can walk or cycle to school if you can, if it's safe to do so and you feel comfortable. That's a good way to reduce emissions from all of the cars. And a really important thing you can do before COP is to speak up and tell all of our politicians that you want ambitious action on climate change and that Scotland needs to do more. Uh, to meet its ambitious climate change target. So your voice is very, very important and politicians will listen to you. So speak up. We saw um, last year and a little bit before just how very important um, young people are in this country and how important their voices are. Um, so that's an excellent tip um, for everybody. We can all make a difference. Um, we're heading to Carntine uh, Primary School after this for the next question. They would like to know what communities or teams of other people do you get to work with in your role? I get to work with lots of amazing farmers. Uh, in my role. So my role mostly covers agriculture and um, land use and climate change. And so I work really closely with farming bodies and individual farmers who are doing great things to help protect wildlife on their land, but also lots of very smart scientists um, with big brains who come up with solutions to things. And I also work with lots of other environmental organisations like the RSPB and um, Woodland Trust and Scottish Wildlife Trust as well. Lovely. Um, back to Granite Bank for the next question. Um, they would like to know how many species of animals are at risk from climate change? I imagine that's quite a large number. Yes. I mean, in, in Scotland alone, one in nine species are at risk of extinction and a lot of those um, will be under greater pressure from climate change. And climate change is an additional pressure on top of all the pressures that are already affecting wildlife, like loss of their homes and loss of their food sources. So we need, really need to get on top of it um, and help these animals adapt and make sure that it doesn't impact them further. Absolutely. Um, Minto Primary School are up next and they are asking how will you persuade most people to switch to electric cars by 2030? Excellent question. I think price is a big um, barrier so we need to make electric cars much more affordable and we also need to work on the battery life so that people have more confidence that the that a charge lasts longer and um, but there's also a bit of um, communication um, we need to do around building trust in, in electric vehicles and ensuring that we have access to charging points um, everywhere that we need them as well. Absolutely. Um, sticking with the electric car theme, um, we're going to Riverside Primary here. Um, they would like to know, will electric cars be able to charge themselves instead of plugging into a charger on the pavement? Potentially. So hybrid hybrid vehicles are already self some of them are already self-charge um, so they charge as they go but um, still rely on some fuel and in future there are lots of innovation innovations going on looking at how we can develop self-charge vehicles or vehicles that charge as you drive them along the road um, 
building charging systems into the road so that as you drive your car along it uh, it takes up the energy and that's being tested in some parts of the world so maybe it's something that we'll see um in the future absolutely and um, we have a question coming in on youtube apples in alba and um, from 7b at altmore park and um, would you like to um sorry they would like to know what you enjoyed most about school so going back to your um, your school life what was your favorite thing well it's a very long time ago <laughs> um I enjoyed I enjoyed art at school so that was one of my favorite subjects and I enjoyed history and biology obviously so I always wanted to do zoology so biology was something that I was just fascinated by and loved biology classes and that has just carried on throughout your life. It does show sometimes you absolutely know what you want to do right from the beginning. If you have a passion or something like that, then go with it and see where it can take you. Um, we are going back to Garnet Bank again next. They would like to know, um, how does the water cycle affect biodiversity? Well, water underpins all of our life. Uh, so the way that we use and manage water is really important. I mentioned peatlands in my presentation and the water cycle is really important for how peatlands function because they're supposed to be wet. And so if you um, cut drains through them, it reduces the water table and makes them much drier. And then that suddenly has an impact on all of the plants and animals that were adapted to live in those wet conditions. Um, but equally, when you know we need to look after our rivers and how the rivers um, run through our countryside is really important as well. So, um, and as we look to climate changing and changing patterns in rainfall, that's going to impact the water cycle and it impacts the ability of the land to both store and use water as well. So, yeah, um, the the water cycle is fundamentally important to your life. And it is and can be impacted by both our actions and by climate change. Uh, we have a question come in on YouTube from St Bridget's next. Um, has COVID had an impact on your job? It has definitely changed the way I've worked. I've been very, very lucky to be able to work from home and have a supportive employer and um, to be able to adapt to online working when the internet works. Um, so it's, it has changed the way that I work, but it hasn't necessarily changed what I, what I work on. Um, all of the topics that we're working on, climate change and biodiversity, are still very much a priority and that hasn't changed. And another question from St Bridget's. They would like to know, are there any protected species which are causing damage to the environment? Hmm. Um, there are some species that are out of balance because of our actions. So maybe there are, there are a few too many of them. And so, for example, um, so, for example, we talked about deer. So if there are too many of one animal, they can have an impact on the environment. They can eat too much vegetation. And um, so I wouldn't say I wouldn't say it's the protected species that are um, impacting the environment. But when species aren't uh, within their sustainable limits and the ecosystem isn't functioning as a whole, maybe we're missing predators or um, we're we're impacting the vegetation, then then it can have an overall impact. And that's why we need to make sure that those habitats um, and those ecosystems are brought back into balance. Mm -hmm. A very small change can sort of have a ripple effect, can't it, and affect everything um, going down the way and up. Um, so very imp important to, to remember that smallest of changes can really have a big effect. And um, we have another question coming in from Apples in Alba. They would like to know, so that's Almore Park, would you like, uh, sorry, would, they would like to know, I'm having such trouble with these. <laughs> what advice would you give to someone interested in a career in conservation? So one thing that you can do is um, become a member. Um, lots of uh, environmental organisations have young uh, members um, and and they're so important to us. Um, we have youth ambassadors as well and making links with uh, conservation charities that you believe in and that you would like to support is really important I think for getting that experience and getting that access to information and then when you're a bit older volunteering get stuck in your local communities um, you can do citizen science so there are lots of um, bird surveys for example that depend on people 
um, volunteering to do them. So I would just say, find out what you're really interested in and contact us, send us emails. We're happy to answer questions. And if you get a chance, volunteer. And, um, and maybe when you're um, in secondary school, do work experience with one if you can. Lovely. Now we have about five minutes left. We're going to um, pack a few more questions in here for you, Sheila. And we're going back to St. Bridget's now. So this is from Primary 70. By killing animals for food, does that lead to their extinction? Very good question. Mm. So some people in the world really depend on wild animals for their food. And we need to protect them both. So um, we need to ensure that people who depend on, on wild animals for food are able to access that. The problem comes in when we take too many. And, and that's the issue that we're seeing is that um, historically, we have just taken too many animals for food. And when you add to that, that we are also impacting the animals' homes and we're impacting their food sources. So we don't just kill animals for food, but we kill their food for food. Um, and, and so all of that is having impact and all of that together can contribute to extinction. Um, our next question is from Carntine. Um, they ask, what inspired you to study zoology and which is your favourite animal? Do you know, I always knew that I wanted to study zoology before I knew that there was a word for it. And I just knew that I wanted to work with animals. Um, I, I used to just, back in the days when you could run around the countryside, um, looking at frog's pond and watching tadpoles and listening to bird song and playing on my tin whistle to get the birds to respond and various other things. I just knew I wanted to work with nature. And um, I remember discovering that there was actually a degree in that and being overjoyed knowing that that's what I want to do, I want to do zoology. Um, what was the other part of that question? Sorry. Hey, what was your favourite animal? It's my favourite animal. Um, I'll go for two Scottish animals. I love puffins and pine martens. Lovely. Uh, our next question is from Tinto Primary School. Um, what influenced you to do a job in this area? Was it shows like David Attenborough? What a guy. Well, I think David Attenborough has influenced everybody who works in conservation. Yes, his, um, his shows are just incredible. But also, um, I read lots of books. Um, I read a lot about Diane Fossey, um, who worked on gorilla conservation, um, and Jane Goodall, who worked on chimpanzee conservation. And um, I just devoured information about people who worked with animals and all of that influence. We have just time for one last question to come in, and that is going to be from St. Bridget's. What's the most dangerous animal you've dealt with? Oh, that's a good finisher. <laughs> I'm gonna go back to badgers because they can bite. <laughs> you don't want to you don't want to corner a badger. Um, no, I don't. They have a, a, they have a very strong jaw. Uh, <laughs> Um, but yes, unfortunately, I haven't been up close and personal with many other uh, dangerous animals. That's probably a good thing. <laughs> well, can I just say a big thank you, Sheila, um, for joining us from all of us here at Glasgow Science Centre and from all our learning abs uh, lab schools and all our other viewers this morning. Thank you so much um, for sharing your time and your expertise your expertise with us it's been absolutely fantastic um for all of you watching today thank you so much for all those questions they were absolutely fantastic um and i hope this has given you some food for thought and some ideas as to what you can do at home and within your school to help climate change um so from us all here at glasgow science center thanks for joining us for curious about our planet and i hope you join us for some more sessions thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day